pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I don't know if you've noticed this, but there's a door on stage. You see that? It just appeared. Yeah, it's not true. It's, it's just the door. There's nothing, nothing crazy, but it's kind of a curiosity, right? Uh, it's, it's here for a, a purpose, and that purpose is to tell you knock-knock jokes. <laughs> so here we go. Much to the chagrin of my kids who are no longer in this service because of how it went first service. Knock, knock. The owl says. And the internet turned off the live stream. That's exactly what was supposed to happen. The owl says who. That's exactly right. The owl says who. You're so smart, church. This door is going to seek to serve as a reminder for the next couple of Sundays as we're uh, entering into this conversation again. We we call this time every year our mission emphasis. As Pastor Bob has introduced again this morning, we're entering into these these weeks together. Over over the next two Sundays, after this Sunday, we'll hear from uh, two of our supported missionaries that we are in relationship with, and and, and we are uh, moving along in this progress of pursuing again, receiving our faith promise commitments. We'll talk about why it is we are on mission with the Lord over these next several Sundays. These these weeks are are part sermon series, part emphasis, but uh, over these next four weeks, we're going to talk about why it is important for us to acknowledge that we are to be on mission as a church. What it means for us to be on mission as men and women and boys and girls. What it means for us to be on mission as dads and moms and sons and daughters. Before we talk about the mission, the door causes uh, this illustration to come to light. I I wonder, if you are curious by nature, do you ever enter into a place and try doors that you don't know whether you're allowed to try those doors or not? How many of you have ever tried one of our doors here at the church just to find out what might be behind door number three? Chris Colna just raised his hand. That's why we put locks on doors. There's something about doors. I, I don't know exactly what the statute of limitations are uh, for some of the things I've done in high school and college, but here goes. There have been some places that I've been in that I'm not quite sure I had permission to be in. I don't know if I'm allowed to share these stories, but in high school, I, I found my way into a tire retread factory. What a random factory in Spartanburg, South Carolina to find myself, and I don't even know if my dad knows this story. Don't tell him. Me and some high school buddies found our way into a factory. I don't know how. It just happened, right? Found our way inside this factory. It was absolutely fascinating to see how the process works. It was an abandoned warehouse full of leftover machinery and stuff. In in college, I I found myself in a, a number of those kinds of places. One was an abandoned jail. That was cool. You can bet me and my college buddies tried those cells, and I'm so thankful that nothing bad happened in those moments. We also found ourselves in another sort of manufacturing facility, abandoned, long since uh, uh, abandoned, and there was some office space in these warehouses that we would just walk through in the middle of the night, real safe, right? Don't do that, kids. There was this one facility, this manufacturing facility, this one warehouse that had in the center, I'm pretty sure someone staged this just for this moment so that I could tell you this story. In the middle of this gigantic warehouse was this chest freezer, a big chest freezer with its lid closed. And I remember we entered into that warehouse and we had flashlights and we're like, what is that? It's a freezer. Oh my goodness, somebody open it. And everyone's like, no, you open it. No, you open it. You can imagine the scene, right? And we all kind of surrounded it and Eventually, we all put our hands on the lid of the freezer to lift it up. Surely, there was going to be someone's body inside or some kind of den of snakes or something spooky, something awful, rotten meat. Who knows, right? We opened it up, and there was a giant stuffed teddy bear staring at us inside of this freezer. Doors are fun. Right? Be, being curious sometimes it, it is adventurous, sometimes it, it, it's part curiosity, it's a pursuit of knowledge, it's, it, it's fun to explore abandoned 
places. It's fun to explore places that you don't have very much familiarity about. It's fun to be in places that not everybody gets to go and see. Right here in town, um, it's the Daimling Hotel that I most recently got to explore. It was Bobby Johnson who invited Angel for Pastor Angel for a tour, and I overheard the invitation, and so I invited myself along. I want to go in this old hotel. It's absolutely fascinating. And, and Bobby Johnson has keys to some of the locked locations in the basement of the Daimling. We got to go. I, I remember specifically Bobby giggling as Angel and I are exploring and trying to out-explore each other and trying doors and asking Bobby if we could have a key to that door. Thank you for letting us do that. A couple years ago, we got to have our pastors and spouses retreat at the Genetti Hotel in Williamsport, Pennsylvania, a hotel built in the 1920s, a little little newer than the Daimling, but still just as fascinating. And I was out of town, and I was around other mischievous pastors and their eye-rolling spouses. And I'm thankful that amidst my curiosity, I'm thankful to be married to a wife who at least knows that she just has to roll her eyes when I start trying doors down hallways to see where we might be able to explore next. Usually, she says, don't do that. There's something about closed doors. There, there's something about doors in places that we don't know about. There, there's lots to be curious about around doors. What's behind the door? Why is it there? Who put that door there? Is that door locked? If it's locked, why is it locked? Who locked it? Why am I not allowed behind that door? How much trouble can I get in if I found out how to pick that lock on that door? Doors are like that. This morning, I, I want us to think about doors as being opportunity portals, entry points, places where the what-ifs get answered. They're exploratory access point. This this door, this, this visual, I, I want it to be our emphasis over these next weeks as we pursue what it means to be and explain on mission. I want to explain and emphasize what this means by getting us to see, to focus on, to relate to doors of opportunity. Not this door borrowed, but doors. Our congregation here at Hyde Wesleyan, this, this body, this family, this part of the, the tribe of the Church of Jesus Christ, this, this congregation has quite a history of what it means to be on mission, to, to join on missions. You, you see it when you walk into the, the lobby every Sunday or every time you enter into the space, you see our world map purposeful to remind us that we aren't just an expression of faith for here. This is not a country club. We exist to to be on mission with the Lord. It's baked into the DNA of our local church here at Hyde to know the importance and to emphasize what it means to be on mission. As Pastor Bob explained just a little bit ago, the yearly emphasis that we, we spend these, these weeks together is an intentional time set apart to remind ourselves of the simplest of truths that God, the creator of all things, is on mission to reach for the souls of humanity, to love in order that transformation can take place. And he invites you and me to join him on mission. We presented our faith promise goal this year of $70,000. And we invite you, we have been inviting you to join us in praying and fasting to ask God specifically how he is asking you to join him on mission to give sacrificially in the area of faith promise here at Hyde Wesleyan Church. To, to start, to start this conversation, to, to emphasize what it means to join God on mission, what, what it means to uh, open and explore doors of opportunity for us as, in, a, in our walk of discipleship. I want to look back at Jesus' calling of the first disciples from Matthew chapter 4. It'll be on the screen for you if you can see past the door. Matthew chapter 4, starting with verse 18. 
One day, as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, also called Peter, and Andrew, throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. Jesus called out to them, Come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. A little farther up the shore, he saw two other brothers, James and John, sitting in a boat with their father, Zebedee, repairing their nets. And he called to them to come too. They immediately followed him, leaving the boat and their father behind Bow your heads one more time. Use this time, Lord, I pray, to challenge our hearts, to awaken us to your calling again. In Jesus' name, amen. There are three things this morning that I want us to take note of as it relates to doors of opportunity and specifically Jesus' initial call to these first four disciples here. In in this narrative that we have recorded for us in Matthew's gospel, there's some uh, impacting reminders for us that that can give us applicable points of focus as we navigate what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ in 2023. The first focus point is I want us to understand again the voice of the one calling. The first thing in this passage that stands out to us is the the voice of the one who is calling. It is the voice of Jesus here calling his disciples. Have have you you thought much about voice, the the importance of voice? I, I, I have something going on inside of my sinus area right now, and so my ears are plugged up, and I can hear out of my right ear and not so great out of my left ear. And so right now in this time, Voices sound a little weirder than normal. Jess was trying to whisper to me between services, and I was like, I can't hear you. Sorry, help me out. So she wrote me a note and told me she loved me. That part's not true. (laughs) The importance of voices is obvious, right? We we know certain voices. We can hear a certain voice, and we can know pretty close whose voice that is. Is. I, I, I was seeing a, a video came across my, my news feed, which I admitted in first service. News feed sounds a lot better than I was scrolling through Facebook and saw a video. I was scrolling through Facebook and saw a video of a brand new baby, brand new baby being born. And this baby was being carried by a nurse and this baby is screaming. You have heard the newborn scream. The beauty of this video is this baby is being brought back over to a mother still laid out on A bed, and the mother is, for the first time, setting her eyes on this brand new baby. And the mom begins to speak words of soothing comfort to the baby. And it's like a switch goes off. This screaming, wailing child has a switch turned off and changes its tune to a calm, cooing sound. At the sound of its mother's voice. It's a beautiful video because it relays something that I saw countless times with our two changing their demeanor at the sound of a voice. I saw it countless times. Jess had that magic ability to calm our crying babies with just her voice. I, on the other hand, had to use Benadryl. (laughs) I wrote that. Voice is important. The way God created us to know voice is miraculous. To pick out a voice among a crowd, the the ways voices blend in a song, sometimes it's the way we can immediately recognize a voice. Someone calls us on the phone, and before we look to see who it is, we hear a voice, and we know, I know that voice. We know that a baby knows its mommy's voice because the mom has been speaking to that baby during the entire pregnancy. We know children know a dad's voice because dad takes time to talk to them. Students know the voices of their teachers because they're in proximity with them. We know famous voices because we watch them. We listen to them on repeat. And while these disciples hadn't yet heard the tenor of the voice of the Lord, 
somehow, somehow they were prepared to hear the voice of the Lord at that moment and know what he was inviting them into was the journey of a lifetime. Something about his calling, something about his voice must have been familiar. Something about his presence connected to his voice of calling them wasn't strange to them. The voice of the Lord was recognizable somehow. The Apostle John captures Jesus' teaching on the reputation of the good shepherd's voice in John chapter 10. Look at these verses of Jesus speaking. Verse 2. John chapter 10, the one who enters through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep recognize his voice and come to him. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. After he has gathered his own flock, he walks ahead of them, and they follow him because they know his voice. They won't follow a stranger. They will run from him because they don't know his voice. The sheep recognize his voice. He, the shepherd, calls his own sheep by name. They follow him because they know his voice. There's something about the voice. Still small. Something about the voice of the Lord. We love the visual imagery. Maybe you had a picture hanging somewhere in your childhood of Jesus knocking on the door, that visual imagery of Jesus standing at the door and knocking that comes from a passage in Revelation chapter 3. Look at it with me. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Behold, look, I stand at the door and knock, Jesus says. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. Those who are victorious will sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat with my father on his throne. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. I love here that Jesus is knocking and calling. Jesus is not guilty here of something I may or may not have been guilty of as a child of ding-dong ditching. There's no knocking and running. There's no ringing the doorbell and putting your thumb over the camera. That's what we do now, right? Jesus is knocking and calling. His voice is recognizable. His voice is not strange. In this passage, in this reminder of what we have, it is Jesus, the Savior of the world, knocking and Gently announcing his arrival at the door of hearts and lives. Something about his voice, it's familiar. Back to Jesus calling his first disciples, it's important to note what the offer is. It's not only important to acknowledge that there is a, a voice calling, but what the calling is inviting these disciples into, the invitation. In, in Revelation, Jesus' voice, his, his knocking and his call is to invite us to open a door, allow him in to share a meal together. This is where we get that understanding and that illustration that we hold so dear to our hearts of being in relationship with the Lord. Jesus desiring to come in and do life with us, to sit with us, to live with us, to fellowship, to linger, to be present with us. To the disciples back in Matthew chapter 4, he, he is saying plainly to them, come and follow me. I will show you how to fish for men. Come, come and see me. Come and watch me. Come and surrender. Come and give your life up. Watch me. Watch me do this thing. Watch me live surrendered. Watch me love. And love like I love. Come. Surrender like I surrender. Follow my example. Come and watch. Come and see. Come and follow me. And church, this continues to be Jesus' invitation. This continues to be the calling of this dear voice. Jesus is the door of opportunity his voice is audible. His invitation is fulfilling. 
And this is true in a season, in a lifetime, in a true living out of hearing and knowing that there are lots of voices and lots of invitations and opportunities in this life. But there is one that stands above all others. We get lots of invitations. We get lots of asks, lots of uh, invitations to be a part of lots of things. There's a lot of voices speaking into uh, our lives, seeking for our attention, seeking to uh, have us join them on their mission. And yet, there is one that should be loudest and most fulfilling. Now, there's a danger in this. Can I let you in on a little, little secret in pastoral ministry? When someone says that they've heard the voice of the Lord calling them to something, there's some red flags that come up in, in some of my conversations with people, especially when someone says something like, God has told me, dot, 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 followed by something that goes against God's voice elsewhere. I want to say it this way, that if God's voice sounds like what I want God's voice to sound like, there should be a red flag. If God's voice says, settle. If God's voice says, you deserve to be happy. If God's voice says, be comfortable. If God's voice says, it's okay in this instance for you to be hurtful or harmful or hateful towards someone else. If God's voice says any other in a long list of comfort phrases that we often say to ourselves. We must continuously go back to the reminders of what God does say. Of what God's will is clearly laid out for us. O often. The invitation from the voice of the Lord is strikingly different than what I would want him to say in my human response, in my creature comforts mindset. L listen to what Jesus says to the disciples in Matthew chapter 16. Jesus said to his disciples, verse 24, if any of you wants to be my follower, if you want to be a disciple of mine, Jesus says, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, a death wish, a sentence to death and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you'll lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit? If you could gain the whole world, but lose your own soul, is anything worth more than your soul? The voice of the Lord, his invitation is always one of self-denial of surrender, of letting go, of giving up our way. These are the constant invitations. This is the consistent bidding, offer, invitation of the Lord Jesus. You have, you have words of comfort that you offer to one another, words that calm, calm you down. I love you. You've got, you got good words that you calm someone else down, your kids, your spouse. Chill out. Don't say that. Four words of Complete and utter discomfort for me, reminders. Four words of discomfort. It's not about me. This is the invitation of, of, of the Lord to let go of ourselves. His voice is knowable. His invitation strikingly counter-cultural. Counter Truth is, Jesus saying, give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me is strikingly different than any phrases that include, rise up, take back what makes you happy, what you think is yours, hold tight. Jesus' invitation to join him on mission requires a denial of self that few of us are comfortable with. Perhaps even fewer willing to completely submit to. And yet, these disciples are a powerful reminder of extraordinarily miraculous surrender. 
Their response to Jesus' voice and his invitation serve as a powerful reminder to us, a powerful example to us as as we navigate things, as we re-remember what it means to say yes to the Lord. That's the third point this morning, the response of these disciples and ours likewise. The response of the disciples, back in Matthew 4, verse 20, they left their nets at once. They immediately followed him, leaving the boat and their father The response of these disciples, Peter and Andrew brothers, James and John, these brothers, their response, if I'm honest, has always caused some level of discomfort as we read the gospel. Some some level of discomfort in reading this account and understanding that they left everything in order to follow Jesus. There's there's anxiety, there's tension in, in, in the reality of how they said yes to the Lord. The immediacy in which they responded is is noted purposefully. Both Matthew and Mark account for this intentional repeating of leaving their nets, leaving behind the boat, their job, their family. The response of others like Matthew leaving the tax collector booth in a moment, a lucrative career in tax collecting. I I think it's important, I think it's worth understanding that the disciples' response to Jesus, the response to his verbal invitation because they had already been prepared in their hearts to respond. They said yes because they had already somewhere deep inside of them said yes to knowing that the Messiah was coming, to knowing that salvation was going to be made available. They they were looking for it. These good Jewish boys and the other disciples, men and women, would continue to answer Jesus' invitation to come and follow, they would do so because they knew even partially, even without a full understanding, they knew partially what this invitation of the Messiah would mean. To come and follow was a humble invitation, a humbling invitation, an honor to be chosen, to have the opportunity to join Jesus on his mission. They said yes, they left everything behind because they had already said yes to the potential. Willing to say yes because they knew, partially. Surely they didn't know everything they would face. They couldn't have known the future. They didn't know the path forward. They didn't know their next move. There was no map. There was no step-by-step directions that they were agreeing to. But... The voice of the one calling was familiar. The invitation to leave behind what was normal to them, to leave behind. The invitation was fulfilling. It was more than fishing, more than the norm. It was the adventure of a lifetime. It was an opportunity they couldn't have imagined. So their response was immediate not without cost, not without thought. Luke records Jesus' words in chapter 14. And Jesus teaches this, if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. But don't begin until you count the cost. For who would begin construction of a bridge on 322? Who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there's enough money to finish it? Don't begin until you count the cost. If you don't carry your own cross, you can't be my disciple. What does this mean for us? Knock, knock. Jesus, Jesus is saying, come, follow me, join me, love like me, see like me, have a heart like mine, pursue like I do. 
give yourself up like I do. As children of God, as committed followers of Jesus Christ, we are invited to the most fulfilling mission. To follow where Jesus goes. To put all the other invitations, all the other voices to the side. To leave everything else behind. This doesn't mean, it doesn't mean necessarily that God will lead us to leave our job, sell our house, head out on the mission field, travel to some other continent or be a part of a church plant in some other part of the state or county, but he might. The call of the Lord to join him on mission does mean being a light in your workplace right where you are. It does mean being a light in your current neighborhood, in your community, in your school, in your workplace, around your current classmates, around your current coworkers and teammates. And his call seems to be continually throughout Scripture a call to give up. Self denial, we call it in the church. Giving up something, giving up more somethings in order that the mission, the great mission of making disciples of all nations, the mission that some have surrendered their entire lives for. Giving up something as church members, church participants, men and women following the cause of Christ, giving up in order that someone else may be able to say yes to the mission field they are called to. The voice of the Lord is calling. His invitation is more than fulfilling. And our response is to be both immediate and continuous, even amidst the anxieties, the unknowns, the tensions, the missing pieces. Let it be said of us that we too say yes, even before we know the door of opportunity God is presenting us with. Will you stand with me? There's a lot of doors. A lot of opportunities, a lot of open doors, a lot of closed doors, a lot of partially open doors, a lot of strange doors. Some of you opened the door to serve at Ashland yesterday for their Harvest Fest and gathered in the rain to love on people. Some of you will set up trunks to be a part of Harvest Fest in several weeks, handing out candy to keep dentists in business. Some of you are serving right now in the video booth and the sound booth and teachers serving behind these walls. Some of you don't yet know the door that the Lord has presented to you for an act of service, of joining him on mission for the purpose of building his kingdom. But here and now, you can know that when the Lord shows you the door, when the Lord's voice is clear and he is calling you to come and follow him through an opportunity. Come and say yes to giving towards his mission. Come and say yes to giving something up in order that someone else is able to say yes to joining him on mission in a different way than you are able to. You can know that when the Lord is calling, you can say yes. Let's bow our heads. I thank you again, Lord, for this day that you've given to us. Thank you for your continuously calling voice. Thank you for the familiarity we have with the voice of the Good Shepherd. 
Thank you that your invitation to join you on mission for the souls of humanity is a mission that you have invited us to join you on. We understand, Lord, that our opportunity is not to do the saving. You are the saving one. May all that we do, Lord, point towards salvation. Forgiveness and freedom. Transformation. Wholeness. In the anxieties and tensions of navigating a, a life where we know you are calling, where your invitation is more than fulfilling, Lord, would you give us the strength to respond? immediately and continuously, denying ourselves, picking up our crosses, following you. As we navigate these weeks ahead, Lord, would you continue to speak to us? Would you remind us of your mission every day? I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Next week, we have the privilege of having Two of our missionaries that we support, Rod and Nancy Zottarelli, they will be here. Rod and Nancy are continuing to answer God's call as pastors to missionaries. Their job is to train and equip new and seasoned missionaries to thrive in and off the field. They invest tirelessly by caring for missionaries and their families, most of which have gone through trauma or transition. They in invest intentionally their, their time traveling to Visit, mission, visit missionaries and families to ensure that they're cared for, encouraged, and equipped to overcome obstacles and pursue opportunities. I'm proud of the relationship that we have with the Zotarellis, and I want to remind you that your faith promise commitments helps a couple like this continue to do the work of being on mission in their unique season and field. I hope you'll come back next Sunday to hear from them as they share from their hearts. God bless you, church. I love you. If you're able to help us with the chairs, we would appreciate it. God bless you.